it is my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Mike DeFlorio, who will be giving the next talk. Um, he, uh, Mike is a, a research analyst at the Center for Western Water, uh, uh, excuse me, Western Weather and Water Extremes um, at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at the University of uh, California, San Diego. And uh, he is uh, interested in a wide range of um, uh, S2S, um, uh, sorry, uh, of research topics, um, um, uh, including uh, the S2S predictability of atmospheric rivers and precipitation, mid latitude teleconnected responses to tropical forcings, aerosol cloud interactions, um, global uh, coupled climate modeling, and uh, California extreme precipitation events. Um, Mike, welcome. Thank you, Judith. I will share my screen and go into full screen. So yeah, I just wanted to thank um, both Judith and Anish for uh, all the hard work of organizing this and for inviting me to speak. And also Jaime and Rich for um, such great talks preceding me. Um, so yeah, as Judith alluded to, I'll be talking today about um, S2S forecasting and some underlying challenges associated with forecasting atmospheric rivers um, ridging and also just precipitation more generally um, over the Western US. So um, this is kind of a, a theme, been a theme of, uh, of the workshop, you know, in the last few weeks, but we know that many end users um, in the applications community are interested in improved S2S forecasts of atmospheric quantities. So this is a sort of flow chart describing that from White et al. Um, 2017. And the, the, you know, at the top there, we have this kind of demand from end users, which starts you know, the interest in uh, improving S2S forecasting. So there's a reliable and actionable information that is needed for decision-making. And then you know, going further down, um, we see that you know, there's a variety of lead times and a variety of actions um, or decisions that can be influenced, you know, at those various lead times. And um, I'll show kind of a, an application of this chart to water management in the West in a few slides. But this is just, I thought, a nice um, articulation of why there's been such a push really in the last five years, or one of the primary reasons there's been such a push in um, aiming to improve S2S forecasts. It's been a longstanding problem, right? This is, you know, especially on the seasonal time scale. Um, it, it's been many decades of research that have led us to where we are now, but um, it's, it's this fundamental demand from end users that has driven a lot of the recent concerted effort in improving S2S forecasting. So in the West, we're um, in a particularly unique region uh, for trying to make progress on this issue. And Fundamentally, the challenge that end users have to deal with here is that we experience in our region the largest um, interannual variability of wintertime precipitation relative to average conditions. So this is a, a map that's articulating that. It's showing the coefficient of variation in year-to-year -year precipitation normalized by average precipitation. So the, the take-home is that if you look, for example, in the eastern half of the US, the, um, the dark blues and light blues indicate a low coefficient of year-to-year -year variation, meaning that relative to the average conditions, there isn't much interannual variability in wintertime precip. Whereas in the West, and especially Southern Nevada um, and Central and Southern California, we have relatively high um, uh, interannual variation in this quantity. So um, just going back for a second, th this is really, if you were to articulate in one slide, or with one picture, why water resource management in the West is such a challenge, this would be a, a primary demonstration of that. Um, and we're experiencing that now in California and in the West more broadly with you know, uh, an interannual period of extreme drought, which I'll touch upon in a few slides. So just looking, you know, I, I showed that diagram from the White et al. paper, which is really a general um, depiction of end user needs as a function of lead time for better S2S forecasting. If we apply that to um, the West and for water management, 
this large interannual variability that we, we looked at in the previous slide really increases the demand from water managers in our region for better S2S forecasts. So it's just because there's so little um, year to year persistence in, uh, you know, in the sign of the precipitation anomalies that we get, it really uh, you know, makes it a harder problem for water managers here. So we, we created this figure, which was, um, this is an adaptation of a figure that was published in EOS um, an article that we wrote and was published earlier this summer, just outlining the specific lead dependent decisions for water managers in the West um, as a function of lead time, starting from weather um, out, you know, on the left side of the diagram here, all the way out to climate. And in the S2S um, timescale here, you know, there's a variety of decision support needs that water managers have. And then, you know, modes of variability and other physical processes that we know impact predictability. And again, just going back for a second, three of the modes of variability that I'll really be focusing on in this talk and that we heard um, Jaime and others, you know, touch upon are um, the MJO, QBO, and ENSO uh, modes of variability. So I just threw these slides in um, this morning. A colleague had just sent over um, a, a PDF summary that uh, NOAA and USDA and others have put together um, one of the more recent updates for the U.S. Uh, drought monitor over the Western U.S. So this is a map that was released last Thursday. And so you can see that, you know, really across the entire region and especially, um, you know, near the upper Colorado River Basin into Utah, Southern Nevada, um, you know, a, the pipeline from the Colorado River that feeds a lot of our water uh, supply in California we are experiencing the highest intensity uh, level of drought. So we are in the exceptional drought category in many of those locations. Um, extreme drought is, the, is the, the second worst and that's covering you know, all of the other areas um, in the state of California that aren't uh, in the exceptional category. And um, some of you may have heard in uh, the news recently, for example, in Southern Nevada that Lake Mead um, which is a, a primary local water resource for that community, um, is approaching its, its lowest levels in the historical record. Um, and it may have reached it. I haven't looked at the most recent update in the last few days, but it's a situation that's worsening day by day. Um, and in California, it's triggered the declaration of uh, emergency drought measures from the state, uh, the governor's office. And this is just another way of looking at that, um, the drought in, uh, in this, this region. So this is a percentage of normal precipitation uh, for the last year. So going back to last July and up through uh, last week. And so again, you know, through, especially in Southern Nevada, Central and Southern California, you're seeing um, the percentage of normal precipitation values all the way down to, you know, 20 to 30%. So just, um, highlighting a current ongoing situation in the West that is really relevant for the objective of the community to, uh, to improve S2S prediction of precipitation. So this is a, a, a really nice schematic from the, the MAP effort, um, the S2S prediction task force put together. I think it's probably been uh, presented uh, already in the, in the summer school, but I thought it was a nice introduction to some of the topics I'll be talking about over the West. So it's really just, um, you know, depicting the, the, the symphony of uh, physical processes and potential predictor fields that we're interested in over the Western US to try to better um, the prediction of precipitation and atmospheric rivers and ridging and all of these related processes at S2S timescales. And um, there's, you know, key model data listed in the upper right hand corner there, which I'll um, touch upon again in a, a couple of slides. So I, I now have a couple of slides of background on potential sources of S2S predictability that are particularly relevant for the Western US. So I've broken it down into uh, seasonal and sub seasonal timescales. And this is not an exhaustive list of the potential modes of variability that we are interested in. Um, it also, these slides won't necessarily touch upon all of the ways that the individual modes can interact with each other um, and synchronize with each other to, to you know, enhance or de-enhance predictability. But um, we'll start with ENSO, uh, you know, the well-known mode of interannual variability in the tropics. 
And if we just focus on how um, ENSO is impacting the Western US, this is a really nice, uh, simple summary from Yet et al. 2018. And um, the left plot here is just showing um, Z500 and SST composites during DJF um, uh, composited on warm and cool phases of uh, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. So you get uh, the canonical El Nino pattern composite in, whoops, in the left and uh, the canonical La Nina pattern on the right. So the, the key take home here is that this enhanced um, troughing and ridging respectively can influence the teleconnected response of precipitation um, conditioned on El Nino and La Nina in our region. So again, this is just the canonical response. There obviously are different flavors of the SST variability in the tropics that will impact the extratropical circulation response in a mean sense. And of course, um, you know, because there are other com uh, confounding factors in the climate system, ENSO will only be one such, um, you know, pr uh, component of the climate system that affects the seasonal uh, anomalous distribution of rainfall in the West. But it really is a, is a mode of variability that has caused um, issues for scientists in the West from a PR perspective, because the canonical relationships don't always work out but um, communicating that to stakeholders when it doesn't work out is a real challenge. And so uh, we, we should just keep in mind that it's still you know, a foundational component of many of the prediction systems uh, statistically or you know, looking in dynamical systems that uh, can help us make progress on this issue. So shifting to uh, the subseasonal time scale, so thinking more about like two to six weeks um, lead time, so ENSO, you know, because it's slower varying, uh, you wouldn't expect it to have as much of an impact in, in isolation on predictability on those timescales. So as Jaime uh, mentioned in her talk and gave a really nice overview of um, two of the potential sources of predictability that we're interested on in these timescales for the West are um, the MJO and QBO. So they're, they're interesting in dependent of each other and particularly interesting as uh, lots of research um, in the last five or six years has shown when we combine them and, and look at their, um, their phase locking with each other. So this was um, a figure from a really nice paper um, out of uh, Elizabeth Barnes's group from Colorado State, Tom's et al. 2020. And it's just looking at the fraction of intraseasonal variability. So it's a squared coherence metric um, for, I believe it was 250 hectopascal uh, geopotential height patterns. And the top plot is showing the squared coherence um, uh, conditioned upon all QBO phases. And then the bottom is showing if you, if you do the composites just based on westerly or easterly QBO. And so the point being that the QBO independent of the MJO can have a large impact on uh, you know, modulating large scale circulation um, across the globe really, but in particular across the Western US. And in a couple of slides, I'll go a little bit more into detail about the interplay between the MJO and QBO and some studies that have, that have shown um, how they interact with each other. So um, we'll start that sort of train of thought now. So this is looking um, now at impacts um, first on seasonal timescales um, considering ENSO. So this is just from observations. There's no prediction system involved in this plot or in this analysis. And this is just demonstrating the well-known um, observed canonical correlation between uh, uh, wintertime leading principal components of tropical Pacific SST variability and uh, seasonal precipitation anomalies over the Western US. So this is just using you know, observed data and looking at what the, the typical or what the correlation is between those leading PCs and the precip anomalies. And what comes out of it is a very uh, well-known sort of dipole pattern where um, the warm phase of the El Nino Southern Oscillation corresponds typically to wetter conditions in the Southwest. And you get sort of the dipole pattern that sets up with a bifurcation point around uh, Northern California, where you get the opposite sign correlation in the Pacific Northwest. If we look at subseasonal impacts, again, just considering observed data, um, if we focus first on um, impacts of the MJO and the QBO, which we outline sort of the physical processes 
uh, in the previous slides. If we look at um, the impacts on Western Canada and US AR activity, this was a really nice paper from uh, Mundink et al. 2018, which first looked at these kind of lagged um, atmospheric river activity responses to um, different phases of the MJO and conditioned upon easterly and westerly QBO conditions over different regions along the Western North American continent. So, you know, just showing uh, the areas in green, uh, for example, corresponding to uh, increased AR activity and the areas in red corresponding to decreased AR activity. So again, just appreciating that the phases of these two modes of variability, particularly when considered in, synch in synchronicity with each other, can have substantial impacts on the modulation of AR activity and also skill in predicting ARs. And then uh, another way to look at this, um, this is some work that's um, being done by Jibao Wang, who's a postdoc in our group at CW3. And she is um, looking at kind of a similar, uh, you know, the similar idea of condition uh, coupled MJO and QBO conditional composites of, in this case, flooding, um, extreme flooding duration, frequency, and intensity over California. And again, without getting too much into the granularity of the details, I know there's a lot of um, a lot of results in that plot, but just seeking, whoops, just seeking to appreciate the the large impact that the phase and amplitude of both of these modes can have on these, um, you know, Western U.S. water centric metrics. And that's kind of the, the, the point of, of both of these studies. So another quantity of interest in addition to precipitation itself, you know, that's kind of the end goal for water managers. But we know um, even on weather timescales that precipitation is, you know, uh, is really difficult to predict. It's actually harder to predict. There's evidence suggesting it's harder to predict than IVT associated with atmospheric rivers. So one approach that has really interested water managers in the West is to look at the interaction of different ridge types and circulation regimes with the Western US AR and precipitation anomalies. And you know this is kind of a nice follow-up to Rich's talk, um, which focused on blocking. And he mentioned you know, that there's lots of ways that you can characterize you know, circulation regimes and blocking you know, globally. And um, one approach that um, was led here by Peter Gibson uh, uh, in a paper that came out last year is um, looking at a combined EOF of the Z500 anomalies over the North Pacific and Western US, so the region that's shown there in figure A, um, with the daily land precipitation anomalies over the Western US. So this is just seeking to identify the co-varying um, circulation and precipitation modes that are the most prevalent in the historical record over the Western US. And so um, in Peter's analysis, he pulled out um, three uh, dominant uh, ridge or three dominant um, ridge types that are associated with um, significant drought over California. So that's, they're sort of summarized in um, figure B. It's a, this is kind of a depiction of the ridge detection algorithm that was used in this study to, to do this. But basically there is a north ridge type centered in that top box a west ridge type in the in the lower left box and a south ridge type in the lower right box that show up as dominant modes of circulation associated with drought in California. And what Peter did, um, among other things in this study, was looked at composites of IVT in the left column here on the right figure, and also relative risk of atmospheric rivers and precipitation anomalies Con, uh, conditioned upon the prevalence of those different ridge types. So if you just look at the top uh, row, for example, when uh, we see days in the historical record with north ridge type conditions, we tend to see enhanced IVT um, pluming into the Pacific Northwest and a deficit of IVT over California, which is kind of consistent with the um, precipitation patterns that are I believe it's it may be EOF two here that's showing that in the in the combined EOF methods. So the the take home without going into each individual figure here is that there there are many different ways to do this sort of analysis, but stakeholders are really interested in this combination of circulation regimes with the resultant IVT atmospheric river activity and precipitation anomalies in the Western U.S. 
um, with the hopes that the circulation regimes themselves may have more extended pr uh, prediction skill than just the total precipitation by itself. So that's uh, you know a kind of a conclusion of the background of some of the physical processes, the, the predictands of interest that are impacting water management in the Western US and that are kind of motivating water managers in the West to invest in this research and really collaborate with researchers in designing these applied research projects. And so uh, a key component of you know, making headway on this sort of issue is that once we design, um, you know, these prediction systems, we need to evaluate them. And so without uh, spending too much time on this, because I know a lot of the previous talks have, have gone into detail on this, but we can do this evaluation in really three fundamental ways. We can use dynamical ensembles. So we've heard a lot about the SubEx data set, S2S database, and also NMME for uh, more seasonal timescales. Um, you know, those are dynamically rooted ensemble systems that we can evaluate uh, the skill for predicting any of these metrics. We can uh, create statistical and machine learning models, which we'll hear more about later in the week um, in, a, in a session. And those could involve, you know, canonical correlation analysis, EOFs, and then also emerging machine learning techniques like deep neural nets and random forest. And then there, another way that we could tackle the problem is to do sort of hybrid approaches. And one uh, method that our group at CW3 has, has looked into is training machine learning models, you know, some of which are listed in the second column there, on large ensemble climate simulations. So that with the hopes of generating a larger sample size um, in the historical record over which we can do this evaluation. So um, in the interest of time, I'll go through these pretty quickly. The next two slides I'll toggle back and forth are really just um, showing you uh, an example of the modulation of subseasonal atmospheric predictions, atmospheric river prediction skill in the ECMWF Hindcast system as part of the S2S database um, over, in this case, Central California. So what we did here is created a rock diagram um, plotting hit rate versus false alarm rate. And we, we created this evaluation system where um, hits and misses and false alarms and correct rejections were defined based on the relative position of observed and forecasted AR centroids using uh, the Guan and Wallace or AR detection algorithm. And this is just highlighting um, here, if you look uh, at the triangles here, these are week two lead time forecasts in the ECMWF prediction system. The black is showing uh, the false alarm rate and hit rate that you would expect if you considered all forecasts. And then the red here is the hit rate and false alarm rate that you would um, obtain if you just considered hindcasts that were initialized during MJO phase eight conditions. And this is just highlighting an example of a forecast of opportunity in the ECMWF hindcast system, where you see a 15 to 20% reduction in false alarm rate um, in week two, when the MJO is in phase eight, when you initialize your forecast. And if you go back to this slide, there's a similar picture that comes up in a previous study that we did, which looked at subseasonal skill assessment in a little bit of a different way. But the point being that some of this early work on um, evaluating S2S database models is focused on identifying these forecasts of opportunity at subseasonal timescales over the Western US region. And it sort of sets the stage for what we know and what we don't know. Uh, what are the prediction lim uh, skill limits in, in a variety of these models over the Western US? You know, it, it sort of sets the stage for, uh, for other approaches that we use later on. We've also used, um, in this case, five of the um, S2S database models to do an e evaluation of, oh, sorry, it looks like there's some noise. Uh, maybe I'll wrap up soon. But to do an evaluation of subseasonal prediction of ridging, um, this is work that Peter Gibson has led. And uh, this is, again, used five of these models for um, evaluating the ridge types that I introduced in previous slides. And I won't go again too much into, the, into detail here, but this is just highlighting another way that you can use the S2S database and the models therein um, to look at skill assessments at subseasonal lead times. And <clears throat> I will skip this slide, um, 
I will present more on this topic. So this is looking at seasonal prediction of precipitation clusters in a hybrid large ensemble climate simulation and machine learning model framework. Um, I'll talk more about that next week um, at the, uh, at the, during my lecture on Thursday with that. So to wrap up here, um, one of the, the end results here for Western US water managers is that they um, assist us in designing experimental forecast products at S2S lead times based on uh, these research efforts. And this is just one such example of um, AR activity outlooks that have been created um, and designed with our stakeholders at DWR based on the, the AR hindcast skill assessments that were introduced in previous slides. So this is showing um, daily probabilities of AR occurrence um, from a, a sample forecast from this past winter in the NCEP system at week one and week two lead time. And then when we get into week three, you know, out more into the subseasonal time scale, we switch to a weekly aggregate of AR activity and produce this lower right hand plot here, which is a, an anomalous forecast of AR activity relative to climatological conditions. So we transition from more of a weather type forecast out into a weekly aggregate subseasonal forecast that relies on a hindcast climatology. Um, we also have ridging outlooks that are based on the work that, that I described that Peter led. Um, again, these are on our, our public website during the winter. You can read more about the methodologies associated with them, the relationship to the hindcast skill assessments that were done uh, previously before they get posted publicly. And um, in this case, this is just a, a subseasonal product that's predicting the probability of the three different ridge types that were identified in Peter's work as being important for drought in California. So just to wrap up, um, so more skillful S2S prediction of precipitation is obviously coveted by a variety of end users. We know that the Western US experiences very large swings in total precip, which creates a unique challenge for water resource management in our region. And Western US precipitation and AR activity, we also know, are modulated by the MGO, QBO, ENSO, and you know, other modes of variability on these timescales. And so we can implement a variety of prediction systems, both dynamically based, statistically based, hybrid systems that can uh, be used to evaluate the prediction skill of these quantities over the West. And then we can also use them to identify these forecasts of opportunity where skill can be relatively high compared to the, the average conditions when we look at active phases of these modes of variability and also look at how they constructively or destructively interfere with each other. And the end game of this for Western US water managers is um, they, they really are seeking to benefit from experimental forecast products that have been vetted in this sort of hindcast skill assessment peer reviewed framework um, and tailored in a display sense, in a wording sense, and also in the quantities of interest that they're plotting to, to really uh, tailor directly to water managers. So, so that's sort of an overview of what we do at CW3 and what a lot of the applied research in the S2S community over the West is focused on. These are some references that you can, you can look at. And I ended here with a photo of Lake Mead, which I believe was taken a few years ago when the water level was a lot higher than it is now. I should have tried to find uh, you know, a before and after picture, but I'm sure if you Google it, you can find something like that. So thanks very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Mike. That was great.